Welcome back, all you slick stars, to another episode of Video Game World Tours, a series where we slow down and soak in a game's environment. Today we're looking at the world of Kirby Air Ride, specifically its city trial mode. City Trial is one of the three game modes in Kirby Air Ride. They're all given equal billing on the main title screen, but City Trial has stuck with me all these years. I think that's because it always took place in this area. There's no other stages like an air ride or top ride. The only thing that changes between matches is the occasional random event. But fundamentally, this is the same map every time. I played Kirby Air Ride so much as a kid, and almost all of that time was in City Trial, exploring this relatively small map in 7 minute increments. Look at how quickly you can get from one side of the map to the other. I can't think of a single location in a game I'm more familiar with than this one. I'm sure there's a few of you out there who share that feeling. For you guys, my true City Trial homies, I hope you enjoy this walk down memory lane. For everyone else, I guess you can come too. We're gonna do this by following the rail system around the city. At each destination, we'll stop and take a look around. Once we make a full loop of the island, I'll close out the video by showing off my favorite spot in the game. Okay? Okay, let's begin the tour. The Electric Lounge. This is one of the many areas in the city that remind you this isn't a traditional Kirby game. I'll admit, I'm not the biggest Kirby fan in the world, but I have played my fair share of games, and I can't quite remember seeing areas like this in the games I did play. Three floating platforms with nothing too interesting on them. I mean, it's called the Electric Lounge. What does that even mean? Is this a place where Kirbys would hang out? Is this a club? I never really tried to contextualize this in-world when I was a kid, but now that I really think about it, I can't make much sense of it. It's more of a parking garage than a lounge. The surrounding area isn't any less weird. This whole plot of land is dedicated to these stone structures that you can break through. Just looking at them out of context, I have no idea what these are supposed to be. They kind of look like bunkers, maybe? But there's no entrances to them. I don't know. The game actually does describe what these are. Dilapidated houses. I gotta say, that doesn't help a lot. These look a lot like something a pre-industrialized society would build, one without access to technology to help build much taller and more complex buildings. Whatever, we'll talk more about that later. For now though, I'll point out that you can destroy every single house here, get a powerful star and go to town, bashing into every single one and leveling them. I kind of feel bad after doing that. They're called dilapidated houses, but someone could still live in them. Kirby could have just destroyed someone's house. And bizarrely, a little crowd cheer sound effect plays when you destroy a few. The audience truly yearns for senseless destruction. There's one more place to see in this section. This little tunnel takes you to an underground area. All I want to draw your attention to right now, though, is this big room. During a normal match, there's nothing of interest in here. But during free run, when there's no time limit, all the air ride machines are ready for you to test out. This room gives free run a sense of playfulness. You can try out all the different machines you want without consequence. And the fact that they're all down here, lined up like this, makes me think this is Kirby's personal collection. He's probably rich from selling self-help courses online. Nice place he's got. Our next stop is the City Wharf. I don't have a whole lot to say about this rail station though I do think it's interesting you can go under it. We'll spend most of this section talking about the city itself. After all, this is the eponymous city. 
Buildings tower over you, casting long shadows. They're so imposing. Hmm. I wonder if this scale is correct. Does this feel right to you? Was this building built for a race of Kirbys? It kind of feels right. The length and height of the building seem to mesh well with Kirby's size. But hold on a second. Where are the doors? I'm scouring every building here in this central area, looking for one with an entrance, and I can't find any. Oh, hold on. There's one. A single entrance between all these buildings. But uh, it seems like it's cut off. Oh, you know what? This is a door built for Kirby's. Look at his height, it's perfect for him. So they did take into account a Kirby's size when designing these. Not all the time though. While the door here accounts for how short Kirby is, the windows don't. These windows look like the type you can raise up the lower part to get fresh air from outside. But a stout little Kirby couldn't raise it up all the way. Though some of the windows on other buildings are much more reasonably sized. And to go back to the dilapidated houses from earlier, why do those and these exist so close to each other? Do the Kirby live in the houses and commute to these as office buildings? Or are these expensive Kirby apartment complexes and these are the lower class Kirby metal shacks? Is income equality in the Kirby world really this evident? I've, uh, probably spent more time thinking about this than the developers. Which is fine. They shouldn't have to think about how a little Kirby society would function. Leave them to their programming and leave me to my socioeconomic headcanon. Back to the tour. There's a few buildings with overhangs you can go under. What weird designs for buildings. And you can go on top of them. I remember coming up here a lot to get cool air ride machines. I don't know if there's any rhyme or reason as to what appears where, but I always remember checking this building for my precious wheelie scooter. Also reachable from the building tops is the star pole. Definitely an iconic piece of imagery. If you fly into it during a normal game, power-ups will go flying all over. It's a neat little thing to do at the beginning of every match. The final spot for this section is inside this building. Once you glide over the gap, you can go through this question mark hologram to be granted a random copy ability. But we don't have to do that. We can just hang out here in this little cubby. Castle Hall is a castle. Though inside, it doesn't really feel like a castle. None of the signifiers that indicate something is a castle are here. No red carpets, no thrones, no lavish furniture. All there is is this thing dangling from the ceiling, which kind of looks like a map for the rails that take you around the island, though it doesn't really match up. The inside looking nothing like a castle leads me to think that this isn't supposed to be a castle. But we walk outside and look at this. That's definitely a castle exterior if I've ever seen one. Have you ever seen a train station look like this? This is something straight out of Final Fantasy. Interestingly enough, you can climb to the top and do a little dragoon perch. And hey, there's a little flower up here. It's definitely not easy to reach this spot, so it's nice they hid something for you to find. Though it doesn't do anything. I remember being thrown off by that as a kid. It felt like such an achievement to finally reach the top, but you get nothing for it. There's 100 achievements for each of the three game modes, and not one is dedicated to reaching this little flower. For this one, a stone's throw away from it. Why are these here? These are the only two in the whole city. This one isn't even particularly well hidden. There's definitely some more secret areas we've yet to cover more could have been hidden in, I have to wonder if they did plan more for these flowers, or if they were always meant to be just a tiny little secret with no extrinsic reward tied to it. I guess this section is the best to talk about the water surrounding the island. There's shorelines all across it, and you can even go in a bit. In the water between City Wharf and Castle Hall, there's a few whirlpools. 
They aren't just for show. They actually affect your movement. It's especially fun to charge up your star while in the whirlpool so you get spun around. Your perspective of the world changes as you and the whirlpool become stationary and the world around you spins. I just realized this. When you enter a whirlpool, the audience will make a little oh sound. I wonder what the reasoning behind that was. Okay, that's enough of whirlpools. I don't want to make any of you sick out there. You might have noticed, we're pretty close to the limit of how far out you can go in the water. But around here, limits are only suggestions. If you try to glide over, you'll hit an invisible wall. But if you go high enough, you'll just soar right over. This is a proper out-of-bounds space. It's hard to quite make out where the level starts and the out-of-bounds area begins, because the wave that indicates it becomes invisible the closer you get. If you happen to pass through the wave, you'll be back on the other side and have to glide over if you want back. You can fully circle the island in this out-of-bounds area. And it's pretty easy to get here. It's not like you need to be up in the clouds to make it over. Interestingly though, there is another invisible wall. This one is actually impassable. I'm on the machine with the best gliding stats. You can fly all the way up to your heart's content and you still won't make it over. It's so weird that there's these tiered, out-of-bounds areas, right? Like you have the city. This is where you're expected to play. But if you get a machine that's relatively good at gliding, you can fly over a short invisible wall. And beyond that is a super invisible wall that you cannot pass no matter what. They did know about this middle out-of-bounds area. At various points in the island, you'll come across short ramps meant to guide you back into the intended playing space. It's much like the waves we talked about before. Once you pass that barrier, you can't pass back through. They obviously considered the possibility that a player might glide over the first invisible wall. That's why these ramps exist. But why not bring forward that impassable wall to here? Why let the player wander around the ocean? I don't know if it's intentional or not, but I like that it lets you feel like you're breaking the game. I'm sure any machine could glide over this wall if you got enough power-ups during a normal match. It lets you think you're too powerful for the game to handle. Like, whoa, we didn't expect you to be able to glide this high. Maybe that happened in playtesting. I don't know. Maybe none of that is even close to the truth. Either way, it's cool you can ride around out here. What do we have on the next section of the map? This rock structure is kind of weird. We looked at this little flower before, but it's also bizarre that there's railings on these. This doesn't seem like a place a Kirby could stumble onto normally. Anything else? Oh, of course, there's a giant volcano within spinning distance of the city. Not a big deal or anything. There's lava dragons too. No cause for concern there. Actually, maybe that's why this city is relatively deserted. Maybe this volcano popped up overnight and forced everyone to flee to safety. Or maybe this is just a level for a video game with a bunch of random set pieces that aren't meant to tie together in any way, but regardless, this is a cool area. Evading the spooky lava dragons the best we can, let's head up to the top of this plateau. I'm getting mixed signals here. This is both a dangerous volcano with flames spewing out from every corner, and a rail station like any other. Hell, there's a bridge leading you right to the lip of the volcano. Who would build that? What purpose does a Kirby society even have for an active volcano? Do they do sacrifices? Do they sacrifice Waddle Dees into the flames below? Hmm, probably. Say, there's a rail leading directly into this rock. I generally avoid going into volcanoes, but we can't leave areas unexplored. Down we go. Huh, an ice cavern below this volcano. Is that some volcano lore I'm just not caught up on? I should look that up. 
I am a sucker for ice environments in games, and this always stuck with me. If you want to get out, you can take the jump pad. Riding onto it blasts you far above the city. You gently land on the garden in the sky. It's not much of a garden, but it is in the sky. You can get off your machine and slowly climb up the spinning tower. Finally reaching the top, you're rewarded with only a sense of pride and accomplishment, nothing more. I have to say, it is a unique spot though, being the highest place you can reach. I have no idea what to make of this in-world. Why don't you come up with a theory for once? That's your homework tonight. Back to the volcano. You can take the jump pad, or you can get on this rail, which we'll do in a minute. But what if we went back here? You have to get off your machine to jump over this wall. And of course, for your curiosity, you're rewarded with... nothing. Isn't that quaint? A nice and pointless enclosed area in this ice volcano. I did say you had to jump off your machine to get here. That's not technically true. If you take an alternate entrance into this cave from above, it's possible to glide through. If you do that though, uh, notice anything? You can't get out with your machine. You have to abandon it to jump over this barrier. But if you leave it, you can't take the jump pad, and you can't ride the rail. Is Kirby truly stuck in this volcano for eternity? Unfortunately, he has a way out. He can just walk down the path of the rail. And it's not a short walk either. Well, relative to the city it isn't. Eventually, the ice fades to dirt. There's this peculiar little room between you and your freedom. Yep, this is a cave. You walk through this clearing, and you're on the opposite side of a one-way wall. I wonder how the Kirby's built that. The final stop on the railway, Green Canvas. Green Canvas is different from all the other areas we've looked at so far, in that this is what you'd expect from a Kirby game. Green grass, water, trees, even wispy woods. Though he isn't going to cause you problems like in other Kirby games. He's content just to wiggle about and mind his own business. That's not to say you can't start trouble. If you bump into him, he'll recoil a bit. It's satisfying to take out some of that pent-up frustration on him for all those fights he started in previous games. You really just get to pound on it, him. I forgot how bad I always feel when defeating Wispy Woods. Sorry, pal. There's a lot of trees around here. You just kind of plow them down when riding on your star, but off your star, you can't do much of anything to them. You can stand on top of the trunks, though if you try to stand on the leaves, you'll fall through. Starting at the edge of the forest are some rushing waters. If you jump in, you'll get carried away downstream. We won't head that way just yet. For now, how about these? Do Kirby's play golf? These holes are big, like five times the size of a Kirby. Do they play golf with themselves, like in Kirby's dream course? A bunch of random rocks, nothing too interesting here. Though there's this little patch of dirt down the river and past a water wheel. It's a weird little isolated area, but I do know why it exists. It's there so that if you jump off your vehicle and it goes into the river, it'll wash up onto land. Speaking of the river, why don't we hop in? Up the water wheel and onto a plateau. It's kind of isolated up here. I never really found myself venturing this far a whole lot during my normal playthroughs. It's a good bit out of the way, but that does add to its charm. It's perfectly flat, save for the rocks peppered throughout. Okay, time for the best spot in the game. Not my favorite, the best, objectively. Though feel free to offer your subjective, less correct best spot in the comments. We're back in Kirby's Garage. Remember this place? If you go down here, there's a stone wall. 
ram into it enough times and it'll break apart, revealing a tunnel. This room is a lot like the one we looked at earlier, right at the end of the ice tunnel from the volcano. Beside this is a room with a jump pad that shoots you up into the forest above. Take note of the lighting in these rooms. There's an ambient light, almost as if there's invisible lamps. Walking into the final room, it's like those lights were turned off. And at the far corner of the room is this, some models of a few of the city's landmarks. Truly a strange situation. What are these? Why do they exist? Who put them in a cave underneath a forest? I just want to know what was going through the developers' heads when they made this. It genuinely makes no sense, and there's nothing to even hint at what they were going for. But that helps it stick out. I like the mystery this leaves. This scene has been lodged in my brain for nearly two decades because of how understated this room is. Any more, or less, would upset the perfect balance of weirdness this room achieves. Check out my tour of Animal Crossing to explore another game from my childhood. That was a weird tour to do, but I like how it turned out. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.